We are acrobats walking on a tightrope. That rope looks like a flat line from far away, but up close, it's clearly three-dimensional. As acrobats, we can move forward and backward on that line, but something as small and nimble as a flea could go on all sides, including walking upside down. While we are limited in our movement, there is still an entire world that exists just to the side of us. The question is, what lurks in the upside down? This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm Mel. I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is Season 2, Episode 3, and we're continuing our exploration into the fantasy and horror of the alternate reality, specifically as it appears in movies and television. Okay, in today's episode, the introduction that Lisa read for us there is a basically a description or kind of adapted from an episode in the Netflix show Stranger Things from the first season. Stranger Things is going to be uh, coming out with their second season on October 27th, uh, and this seemed like a perfect time to discuss this really popular show uh, when we were talking about alternate realities and alternate dimensions, which is kind of pretty much what Stranger Things is, this idea of the upside down. One thing that we noticed while we were doing a little bit of research about Stranger Things is that a few scientists who deal with quantum physics, string theory, ideas about parallel universes, say that for the most part, Stranger Things gets it right with this idea of possible parallel universes out there if the multiverse is true, and also the idea that we would need a lot of energy to open up these sorts of portals or to communicate with these other sides. So something like a flea might not require as much energy as, say, moving a person or blowing a hole in the space-time continuum and allowing evil things to come through, as we see in Stranger Things. So I guess... I mean, I don't know that we want to necessarily get into the, all the details of all these theories. We we kind of, I think, showed in the first episode in this arc that our degrees really aren't in that. <laughs> <laughs> and we've just read a lot about it, our discussion of dark matter, which is a similar kind of thing in, in a lot of ways. But I guess, first off, as I would say, like, guys, how much do you love Stranger Things? Because I was late to it. I put off watching it. And when I finally did, it was like I couldn't stop. I just loved it. I'll- I'll jump in first, I guess. I mean, I I think it's an unfair question to ask how much I love it. That's like saying, how much do you love your children or something like that? (laughs) Uh, Oh, come on. Well, no, no. I I mean that in like my love for Stranger Things is infinite. Uh, At least because this is a, a time shifted format and who knows how far in the future someone might be listening to this. I I say this having only seen the first season because that is all that currently exists. I have infinite hope that the second season will be just as good because, I mean, it just, it has to be, right? But the first season, I mean, I I loved it. I devoured it in the weekend that it was released. And I think I've ended, I've seen it three times total now. And like, it's, it's not just that it is a good horror story or a good sci-fi story, but it's just very tightly written and the characters are great. And it uses that time period backdrop of the eighties without being hokey and campy and cheesy. I mean, it, it ticks all the boxes and I really, I cannot think of a downside. Also congrats to the actress who played Barb for getting an Emmy because Barb was awesome. (laughs) Yeah. I was, I was upset that she did not make it further. I really thought she would. But I, too, am very excited about season two of Stranger Things. And I think part of what I'm really excited to see what they do is that they, they seem to be following a holiday theme for each of these seasons. And last season, season one, was a perfect kind of horror against the Christmas backdrop, which kind of like what you were saying, Matt, it's difficult 
to do something that's set in the 80s and not come across as super cheesy or overly nostalgic. And Stranger Things really kind of hits that just perfectly. But it's also hard, I think, to do horror against a Christmas backdrop, especially. And there aren't many TV shows or movies. I mean, I think number one that have attempted it, but ones that have attempted it and done it well. Uh, I can I can think of a few things off the top of my head. You know, I always enjoyed like a, of course, Gremlins or Black Christmas, even to some degree the uh, Krampus movie that came out recently. I guess, within the past year or two. But it's really difficult to get a horror that is set at Christmas. And then this season, too, seems to be set around Halloween. And all the posters and ads that I've seen for it have been the the friends going out trick-or-treating as Ghostbusters. And, I mean, just that image alone... (laughs) Just just makes me happy, so I'm really excited for it. Yeah, the Ghostbusters reference. I, w- I was I was already in because I love season one, but that was just like that's awesome and perfect. It, yeah, it really is. It really is. Well, and I think Stranger Things really hits that kind of mix of things that scare us that we've talked about in almost everything so far. The idea of the uncanny, with the child being the victim, the idea of children as vulnerable, but also working well as the hero, particularly in these parallel dimension works that we talked about last week. The the mix of the paranormal and science, which is always really interesting. And I think we, you know, it, it's no coincidence. I think that as, as science moves further, the paranormal doesn't go away, the supernatural doesn't go away. And I think we all kind of have, well, uh, our conspiracy theory fears about what the government may, may be doing or what mad scientists, quote unquote, may be doing. But yeah, just the very real kind of thought in your mind of what if your mirror you were looking in led somewhere else? And I think we ended with this last episode, but this idea of not just that I could go through a wall or a door or crawl into a space and end up in another place because the walls between our universes are permeable, but also that something horrible could come, you know, here, which I think that it's kind of the inside, the internal and the external fear. Like, what are we doing? Like, how are we possibly reaching out into these places we shouldn't reach into? And then how could those places maybe bite back or come over here and do some pretty terrible things here once they realize we're available and open to be invaded? (laughs) Well, Mel, I I think... You hit the nail on the head there, and especially with that idea of talking about, like you said, science, that I think one of the great themes of Stranger Things is that idea of not just probing so far, but like that, that idea of that hubris of science where, yes, there is that idea of exploration, and this is something unknown, and let's look into it, but the main scientist, the guy who acts as Eleven's surrogate father, so to speak. I mean, he's he's gone too far in the name of science. He's not just exploring, he's exploiting. And, you know, he's sending people into known danger just to see what is through that rip in the universe that they've found. I mean, it's it's one of those things that I think horror and sci-fi tackle that we don't have in, in a lot of other mainstream so to speak, stories, which is that idea of science and the limits of science and where should we stop? What's the ethical point at which we should stop exploring because now we're exploiting people or putting them in dangerous situations that otherwise could have been avoided? Oh, yeah. I mean, mean, that kind of uh, trope, I guess, if you want to call it, reaches back into horror as far as, you know, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And it's certainly something that is worth exploring and and it it brings up a a safe place to talk about those issues because if we're talking about it in a fictional realm, you know, I'd rather see the disastrous results on a Netflix TV show rather than know it's happening in the real world. Uh, You know, let's, let's talk about these ethical issues of science here in this kind of safer space. And and that is certainly, I think, one of the fears that Stranger Things hits on and does really well. There, there's a lot of basis in fact, or I'm, I'm saying using air quotes when I say fact here, um, but that Stranger Things 
is building upon specifically like the Montauk project, which I'm not going to go into detail here because we're saving that for one of our mini episodes on page for our Patreon listeners. But some of the, I don't know if you want to call it kind of the iffy ground that stranger things walks and the uncanny is where so much of the horror lies and why something like this is so scary. And part of that, Matt, is what you're talking about with science where you see a scientist and, and, and pushing beyond what any of us are comfortable with, especially because it doesn't involve a child. But you also see that with the limits of how we can interact with the other world. Like once you know there is a parallel universe out there, once they know the upside down does exist, it almost becomes even more terrifying when I think about the relationship between Will and his mother, for instance. And it's one of Winona Ryder's, I think, best performances that she gives. I'm always surprised when I hear people talk critically about it because I loved it. But here you have a child who has accidentally gone into this other realm. And so we know it exists, but then you find out very quickly. And this is, I think we talked about this a little bit in our first episode, but part of the problems with parallel universes is that we often don't know how we end up there. You know, the stories you hear about are always, um, I was walking and I tripped and I fell into an alternate universe. Or I hit, I fell and I tripped and I hit my head and when I woke up, it wasn't the same. I fell down a hole and ended up somewhere. It always seems to be like such an accident. And in Will's case, it certainly was. It, it, it was an accidental thing. But then you realize very quickly that you're in another world where you don't know the rules. He doesn't know how to get back. His mother is desperate to get to him. She doesn't know how to enter. And I think that's where a lot of the fear lies too, is because it's, it's this place that any sort of rules as we know them are gone. Cause you can walk through a doorway and end up in another world. But then five seconds later, that doorway is just a doorway leading to your bathroom, for instance. So what happened? What was the difference? And it, to me, I think that that's one of the really kind of uncanny things that Stranger Things really gets gets right with making it so horrifying. And I think just having that mother-child relationship really magnifies it. Oh, yeah. And, and no one can protect you. You know, it's like if you if you say something or you see something, the people who are running the experiments might take you out of the equation somehow. Or Will ends up in the upside down. His mother can't protect him, which is part of what's so wrenching about what's going on with her. The police can't help you. you if you go to the hospital after you've been in the upside down, they can't really treat you because who knows what the upside down really is. And so you have all these, like, we, we kind of know, I think we've talked about this before with horror, like, we kind of know if something happens, what you do, you go to a doctor or you call the police. Or, or whatever. It doesn't work in the upside down. None of that is there. And if you see it and you come back or you see the creature, no one's going to believe you either. And so the, the powerlessness and the fact that you're a victim of something that nobody knows or believes in, like when Barb disappears, for instance, if people are just like, oh, she must have run away. The horrifying thing that the audience knows is that, no, she became a victim to this predator that was unleashed on the town by this this crazy secret government laboratory that's trying to use these powers in the Cold War. And it just, that that kind of level of not being able to get help anywhere and having to deal with it on your own, I think just kicks up the terror and the horror a notch from just the unknown. Oh, absolutely. Well, and, and the, the main cop figure who is played by, I believe the actor's name is David Harbour. I may be getting that wrong, but that whole storyline is really intriguing as well, because it's just like, as you said, Mel, even as he starts to believe in what is happening, he realizes how powerless he actually is. You know, he's always been the one in control. He's always been the one who, you know, has the badge, has the gun, is able to maintain some, some type of control in his, in his town. And when he starts to realize how big the experiment is and how deep 
the government's hands are on it, I guess. <laughs> you you kind of see him over the course of it realize, okay, this thing is real. I have to fight it, but I've also lost every bit of power I thought I had. Yeah, it's it's it, it, it's an interesting thing. I, I'm I'm very interested to see what they do with his character, and then of course just the character of Will. When you realize what effects does it have on you? What effects? does being in this upside down in this alternate reality what effects does that have on you some something seems to have lingered with him and that's going to that's going to be an, that's going to be fun i'm excited <laughs> i think we all are i i, I <laughs> And I, I'm pretty sure we're not alone, the three of us, and excited. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, no. <laughs> otherwise, there may not have been a second season if there hadn't been this kind of excitement. I, I do believe that at the time when it came out, it was like their most watched show. You know, like that it very quickly became, if not the most watched, then very high up there. Netflix doesn't, of course, release their numbers like you know to Nielsen or anything like that, but it was pretty high up there. At, since we run the risk, I mean, we could talk about Stranger Things for like three episodes total. I, I was going to actually jump back a little bit, and I don't want to be like the broken record talking about science and hubris and all that for the entire episode. But I was going to use that now as a slight segue, because I think that there are two. We have a list that we were kind of working from of different representations of alternate realities. And I think two of them kind of definitely overlap with stranger things in that that hubris and going too far with science and i'm going to start off with another one of my favorite shows which is fringe and i know fringe has popped up a little bit in our discussions already i think in our last episode and if you haven't watched fringe oh my gosh just stop go watch it come back and you can kind of ignore the last season it's it's okay but like the first four are just stellar and it really does deal very heavily with this idea of alternate realities. And really, in this case, just two that are kind of intersecting with each other. I think there's a, they give a head nod to saying that there are infinite multiverses, but these particular two are kind of butting up against each other in such a way that you can, with an extreme amount of energy, go back and forth between them. And... At the risk of giving away too many spoilers, what's really interesting is that one of the main characters, a, a old, he, he's presented as an old, bumbling, mad scientist who's kind of lovable because he's forgetful and whatnot, but you come to find out that at one time he was not bumbling and he was actually quite ruthless, and he was responsible for going between, like, for creating the terror between the two worlds, essentially, and... Oh my gosh, like, I, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but Fringe is ex excellent, 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 excellent. Go watch it. That's that's what I'm going to say there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was one of those shows that, again, handled the idea of not just parallel universes, but characters meeting their doppelgangers and interacting with them, and in some cases, fighting with them. And it managed to be intriguing television the entire time. It never came across as silly or hokey or, you know, any of the things that we've talked about before that are kind of a worry when you do approach this type of narrative. Yeah, it, it was, you know, even, even when they crossed over and you started seeing multiple characters show up, you know, there's the crazy doctor one, crazy doctor two. There's pretty uh, blonde agent one and pretty blonde agent two. There's uh, Pacey one and Pacey two. <laughs> you can see it's been a while since I've seen Fringe and I can't remember any of the character names. Walter, Olivia. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Crap, I'm drawing a blank on, on Joshua <laughs> Jackson's character. Just name. say Pacey. That's what we all think anyway. I never watched Creek, <laughs> so I refuse to do that. And yet... And yet you knew his name. <laughs> All right. So you see, you know, Walt version one, Walt version two, Olivia version one, Olivia version two, Pacey one and Pacey two. Even as you see them on screen together, it, it it doesn't take you out. You know, a lot of times I feel like as a viewer, that takes me out and I start thinking about, you know, oh, that CGI looks bad or that, you know, green screen looks bad or uh, I wonder how they did that visual effect. 
I just kind of bought into it and, and followed it. Well, I think what they handle really well, and the show begins in its first season as a very, like, it felt like X-Files light or a knockoff X-Files or something, but it found its footing really quickly. And once they really start delving into these, the, the parallel universe thing, what's really interesting is, I think it's about season two, season three-ish, where one of the characters is from our world is sort of trapped in the alternate world and replaced with a doppelganger unbeknownst to the friends and colleagues and whatnot. But what's really cool about it is that the opening credits, it's all done as like a CGI thing with the music playing. They alternate colors, blue colored opening credits is for stuff that takes place for an episode that takes place primarily in our world. And red is in the alternate universe and so the really crazy fans really started you know got into the blue universe and the red universe and there were actually like hidden messages that the writers would write because every time they would go to a commercial break they would have different like a quick picture that you know you you see and you're like oh that's like weird and slightly off and kind of creepy and weird but they actually were hidden messages for the viewers so there's like this really tight level of writing and intricate puzzle there as well that people like that it unwound as the internet really started uh, following the show it's kind of cool yeah i was about to say that sounds like how all tv shows are now with that multimedia platform you know where you do stuff online you watch youtube in- inter episodes it sounds like they were kind of ahead of their time a little bit but they were also like it was tucked away and hidden so that like if you were wanting to explore and look at it, that's fine. Otherwise, it didn't like it augmented the show, but it wasn't necessary for you to watch the show either. Like if you were a super fan, you were like, oh, my gosh, this is great. This is cool. And if not, you weren't missing anything vital, I guess. So. Um, but, yeah, it's just there's a lot of great themes that the show plays with lots of themes that like you know, parenthood, as well as the idea of doppelgangers and alternate universes. And, you know, the the questions that we've tackled already of what am I? Because when they start really exploring this alternate universe, these same characters are over there. But because things have played out slightly differently, some of them are radically different in terms of personality. In fact, at one point, there's somebody who dies in one of the universes and his doppelganger is still alive in the other one so you know it's uh it's really interesting it's a great show you know and that's one of the things that I think hits me on such a personal level when we're talking about like the the terror of an alternate universe or meeting a doppelganger and I think it's because I feel like you know the world may go crazy around me but I'm the one thing that doesn't change you know, I know who I am. I know where I came from. My personality is the same. So it would be very, I don't know, it would be frightening. It would kind of be earth shattering, I think, to to meet myself and then have me be radically different, you know, to have a different set of ethics or a different worldview or, you know, different personality traits all because... I had different experiences, you know, so it kind of goes back to that kind of nature versus nurture debate, I guess, you know, but, but how, how does the world and how you experience the world really formulate who you are? That's an interesting philosophical debate to have, but I think if I was personally experiencing it, I, yeah, earth shattering is pretty much the only way I can describe it. I mean, I think my mind might break apart, (laughs) trying trying to understand and it could be strangely fascinating to have a conversation with yourself if yourself is good well that's true yeah <laughs> cuz i what think if, like, what if you're the bad one though <laughs> see but oh. that would equally break my brain <laughs> i think we all know that that we're all the bad versions of ourselves <laughs> <laughs> actually have that like you know goatee going right now so you know that I'm actually evil <laughs> well I, I've, I've got a mustache that I'm twirling at the moment so 
Uh, but I mean, yeah, because that is something that they that they bring up in French and that they do really well. So, Matt, I don't mean to tear you away from French because I know it is one of your favorites. But in all of this conversation, it, it makes me think that this idea of a parallel universe and specifically meeting your doppelganger has a long history in science fiction literature. And um, Mel, I know before we started recording this, you were telling me that there is a anniversary coming up for a Star Trek episode. Yeah, I, uh, I'm a big Star Trek fan. And so when I was doing research for alternate realities, parallel universes, I immediately thought of all the alternate universe episodes of Star Trek that I had seen, in particular going back to the original, the original Star Trek episode, Mirror, Mirror, which created this idea that's run throughout most of Star Trek of the mirror universe, where it's kind of like the upside down, I guess, only it's the exact same as this world, but everything is the opposite. And that episode actually debuted on October 6, 1967. So I think this episode is coming out on October 10th. So, yeah, we'll be past it when this episode comes out, but uh, we will have seen the 50-year anniversary of the Mirrorverse, which I guess a lot of people now, if they're not Trek fans, know from Community's Takeoff with the Darkest uh, Timeline, where they wear the, the goatees. So the reason why uh, people kind of make fun of mirror, mirror and the goatee idea as the, if you're the evil version of yourself, you have a goatee is because evil Spock in the parallel universe and mirror, mirror, mirror versus Spock had a goatee. But basically the gist of the episode is that there's an away team. I think it's Kirk, McCoy, Uhura, and maybe Scotty. And they're on a planet talking to these people who are peaceful and they're trying to trade with them. The, the planet, the people on the planet are like, you're going to be violent toward us and just take what you want. And they're like, no, we don't work that way. And of course, there's a transporter accident with this ionic storm that's going on. And the away team basically gets sent to this alternate reality where everything's evil. And basically, the Federation is barbaric. And they actually, I was rewatching it a couple of weeks ago, and they're even doing like a kind of almost like Nazi salute every time they see each other, but they torture people. They're called the Empire and not the Federation. And so they were also on an away mission and they're about to destroy the planet and just take what they need because they're, of course, evil. But this idea of the mirror universe has gone throughout Star Trek. I'm not sure if there was an... I'm blanking on whether there was a next-gen episode with the Mirrorverse, but I know there were books. And there were Deep Space Nine episodes. Voyager has a Mirrorverse. Of course, Enterprise went to the Mirrorverse so much, I think they actually had separate credits and theme song for the Mirror Universe when there would be an episode in it. But usually, yeah, mirror people, if you're if you're a good person in the regular universe, you're bad in, in some way in the mirrorverse. And if you're bad in the regular universe, you're probably good in the mirror. It's basically the complete opposite. Also, for some reason, in later treks, you also will become like maybe if you're an evil person, you might be more liberated, let's say, in your behavior than you were in your regular universe. Have you gotten, I know you're watching D Deep Space Nine, Matt. Have you gotten to some of those mirror episodes? Yeah, yeah, they've they've popped up here and there. Uh, I can't remember which season I'm in in Deep Space Nine right now, but there have definitely been several ones where they've gone back and forth between the mirror episodes and and it's it's just like you said, it's a com- like the Federation doesn't exist and it's pretty much intergalactic warfare at all times and barbarism and yeah, I mean it's. It's kind of crazy and uh, really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because you usually always have somebody from the regular universe, at least one person who ends up in the bad one and has to figure out how to survive. And either you're like Captain Kirk and you just like figured out right quick how you need to act because he's Captain Kirk. Or Spock, you know, Spock figured out who the bad guys were within five minutes because you can't get past him. Or you have just one person that gets thrown over there and is like, well, how am I going to survive without getting tortured by myself? Because I wasn't Major Kira sees herself several times. The Mirror Universe Voyager people actually wear long black gloves so you know how evil they are. And they're like conquering the Delta Quadrant. So, yeah, it's it's there's a third Doctor, Doctor Who episode where he goes to a parallel Earth where everything is very... Uh, I think it's like unity equals strength is a poster he keeps seeing because it's it's almost like 
it was very fascist, basically. And so this idea that, you know, that's the political uh, evil that these characters, when they go to these universes, end up dealing with. Well, and I, I think it's interesting, too, that you mentioned Community, which for those of you who haven't seen Community, I, I don't know what you've done with your life, and you need to question your life choices, because Community is one of the greatest things ever. I'm, of course, joking, but <laughs> one of the things that began as as a really interesting kind of one-off episode where it explored that idea of a multiverse where there's, I believe, six characters and they decide they're playing some sort of game and they've ordered a pizza and they don't want to go downstairs in their apartment building to let the pizza guy in. So they throw a die and depending on what number it lands on, that's who has to go do it. And so there are six possible timelines that are generated from that throwing of the die. And one of those turns out to be the beginning of what they have as a running joke throughout the show called the darkest timeline, where basically everything that can go wrong does and people end up dead, dismembered, disfigured. Uh, and yes, two, two of the characters, Troy and Abed, there are evil Troy and evil Abed who are both sp- sporting goatees, a la Spock in Mirror Mirror, who throughout the rest of the, the show's run actually the darkest timeline comes back and, and in particular evil Troy and evil Abed come to our timeline from the darkest timeline. And it's a great spoof and send up a mirror mirror while at the same time being its own thing. And we here at the no fear cast have often joked that perhaps we are living in the darkest timeline. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we are now at the technical difficulties we've been having during this recording. <laughs> For those of you who are wondering, yes, the these heretofore unknown technical difficulties will have been edited out. But yes, there were some very strange things that led us to question whether or not we had crossed over into an alternate reality. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just I still want to know if I am the real me or the evil me or the good me. Or maybe I started out as the good me and then evil me replaced me and I just don't know it yet. Well, that's the thing. That could happen. Yeah, you don't know. (laughs) We never know, right? (laughs) Well, you know, what I'm noticing here is, okay, we've got Stranger Things we've talked about, which is definitely horror. We've got French and Star Trek, which I would consider pretty much more in the sci-fi genre than thin horror, even though there is a bit of crossover sometimes. Um, And then Community, which is, I I loved that show. It was one of the only sitcoms I would actually sit down and watch. So you have comedy version of that. And I'm wondering if any of you remember the TV show Sliders. I remember Sliders. (laughs) Jerry (laughs) O'Connell. Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> and this came out, oh, I don't know, was this like a late 90s show? Oh, this was this was early to mid-90s. <laughs> early to, okay. And it was, because and the reason I bring this up now is because we're talking about how the, this parallel alternate multiverse, whatever you want to call it, crosses over genres because Sliders was, it was a sci-fi show, but it was also like this group of good-looking young adults. And it they they could i don't know if it was time travel or jump universes but it became more of a i don't know i may be getting this completely wrong but almost more of a like a detective series than a true sci-fi show like in the way fringe was for instance i don't know i'm having a hard time characterizing it now sliders was definitely sci-fi and and that that's how it started off i think and i i didn't watch all the like its entire run i i watched sporadically through the first season or two when it was on i think it started out on fox and then either the reruns got picked up on the sci-fi channel but i think the sci-fi channel actually started producing new episodes after it was canceled on fox i i I think that's what happened with it i don't i don't think that it was a detective show i think it was more of a they started having a meta plot where throughout these different alternate realities that they were sliding back and forth. But, I mean, the idea is is that these these people end up doing... It's a science experiment gone wrong. It's kind of like Quantum Leap. They, they end up in a parallel universe, and they can't get back to 
their own one, and so they keep going from universe to universe kind of thing. Yeah, I guess I guess detective was the wrong word. I guess what I'm saying is it was more like an adventure uh, series than pure sci-fi. I, well, and I think that they ended up me- like encountering this like presence of I, I don't know what it what what you would categorize it as not like a collective a, a, a group of a group of other people that that were in multiple different alternate universes that were essentially trying to take over all of them or something like that uh if we're getting this completely wrong please like send us an email and correct us and we will absolutely correct ourselves on the next because time. The 90s were a long time ago, and although this is stuck in my brain, I am sure my brain has <laughs> has altered my memory of the show in many, many ways. <laughs> but I yeah, re- it- <laughs> well, all I remember is Jerry O'Connell and the guy who played uh, Gimli, John Reese Davies, were in it. <laughs> it. Yeah, it was a comparing it to Quantum Leap is is a really good good comparison because it was kind of like a good looking young cast doing the the episodes of quantum leap 1995 to 2000 and yes it was it started out on fox and then after three seasons it got canceled and sci-fi picked it up and did two original seasons there so i bow to your memory because it's obviously much stronger than mine no 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 (laughs) <laughs> Bow to Wikipedia because I just looked it up and verify, like I said. Wikipedia overlords. But yeah, that, that was a that was a really interesting show that kind of dealt with you know, it, it, in many ways I think it was a predecessor for like Stranger Things and Fringe and all of that to come. You know, the the idea of government experiment and, and people trapped in the in the midst of that, you know, in the midst of something bigger and just trying to, to survive at some point. Anyway, sorry, Mel, I think I cut you off. So what were you, what were you about to say? Oh, that's fine. I was going to say just the pre- the idea, the premise of sliders that you discover this, oh my gosh, there are other universes I can slide into, but then you can't get, you know, you can't control where you go, right? So they slide over and over again, always trying to go home and they can't. That sounded like the tagline for a commercial. But I mean, that in itself is horrifying, right? Because I, I think that's one of these things that we, we, we've, we I don't know that we've actually talked about it. We talked around it is like, if you go into one of these alternate realities or parallel universes, whether it's an accident or an experiment gone wrong or something like that, you can't get back. It doesn't even, it, like Stranger Things, it's just the upside down as far as we know in the real one, and it takes Will forever. Well, it seems like forever, but it's what a week, which is a forever and the upside down to get back. Or sliders where they just keep sliding into different universe. I think one is like where, you know, uh, the cold, we lost the cold war. And so it's like these, it could be as slight as turning left when you should turn right, or it could be as great as like somebody loses a war who didn't. And you could travel for years and never make it back to the one you left. Or even if you did, how would you know you did? Because what if things changed while you were gone? I mean, that is just terrifying. It's also mind bending, but it's terrifying. (laughs) Because you may be able to go, but it's not like you could just press your garage door open or, like, get back. Like, you may end up in a completely different place. And, and, and the idea of you don't know the implications of what's going to happen if you do make it back. Because, you know, there's always the possibility that if you came back, something else came back. And that's one of the things that I think I think Stranger Things Season 2 is going to explore a little bit more. You know, this idea that there's definitely a monster in the Upside Down that's, you know, a predator preying on people. And if Will can come back, then it can come back. (laughs) And I think that's, you know, it kind of hinted at that in Season 1. I think it's going to explore that in Season 2. But yeah, even if you did make it back, would everything still be... All right. And I think that's one of the things we've we've been talking a lot about television shows and and how they explore it. And the neat thing about television shows is they have multiple episodes usually, you know, to explore the theme and really kind of bring out the the subtleties of the of the horror. But when you're talking about like a parallel universe in a movie version, you know, sometimes you only have 90 minutes, maybe a little bit longer to explore the real terror of something like this. And so sometimes I think that tends to be a little bit bigger. I'm thinking right now of the, the adaptation of the Stephen King's The Mist, where it's not just that there's a rip between this universe and the other, but 
the things that come from that come so quickly and so massively that there's no time to think about the subtleties of the uncanniness. It's just, we've got to fight whatever's coming through. Yeah, Lisa, I think the, one of those terrifying ideas of, like you said, ripping a hole between the universes is, is the, that what's on the other side is not just monstrous, but that we have no time to comprehend. We don't have time to wax philosophical. We just have time for survival, which, I mean, that's kind of what happens to Will in Stranger Things, and that's absolutely what happens in The Mist with the characters trapped in the grocery store, which, by the way, I have not read the source material. It's a Stephen King book, or I, I believe a novella or short story, but if you have not seen the adaptation that came out in the mid-2000s, oh, man, that... It- Oh, uh, it's so, so good. <laughs> right. And, and I, I watched it with my daughter, I think about a year ago. And cause she's, I would have been about 15 at the time into horror movies and that sort of thing. And I'd never seen it before. And I said, Oh, I, I've, I've heard good things about it, but I don't know. And we started watching it and it seemed kind of hokey. And then we got to the end and I will leave a spoiler free thing here, but I will just say we were both numb. Like we looked at each other and we were just like, Whoa, because it is rather bleak, <laughs> but in a very, very, very well done way, in a way that I was not expecting at all. But uh, as far as these monstrous things coming through from this other universe, we kind of gave a nod to this in our first episode of the, the series about alternate realities to a man that we have, uh, we hold in a special place in our hearts, H.P. Lovecraft. And I think this might be a good place for us to kind of wrap up because our next episode will be talking about alternate realities in various uh, books and stories like written stories and I think we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about H.P. Lovecraft then of course it's not going to be solely dedicated to Lovecraft but I think he will be a definite player (laughs) in the next episode so thanks for listening and we'll see you next time